Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 5th of September of 2020. And the article that I'm going to be discussing today, which is the Midas trial, which to be completely honest with you, I've been waiting for it for quite a while now, was published just two days ago on September 3rd of 2020. Unfortunately, this article is hidden behind a paywall, which means that they want like 30 or 40 bucks for it. So that means I'm going to go a little bit more into detail here to try to help you out. But if you could get your hands on this article, I recommend you download it for yourself, read it, and don't trust me. I always got to give the medical disclaimer on this, especially since using Midodrine, which is the medication that I'm going to be discussing today for critically ill patients, is an off-label use of medication, meaning that the FDA does not approve it. To provide a little bit of background as to Midodrine, I do recommend that you check out my post on my website, eddiejomd.com. I've also made a YouTube video as well as a podcast on this, but you have to scroll back a couple a couple episodes to get to it. First of all, what is Midodrin? It is an alpha-1 adrenergic agonist that is orally administered. Its brand name is proamatine. Some people think of it as oral phenylephrine, for example. And what we do is that we give it to patients in the ICU to restore their vascular tone and increase their blood pressure. Part of what we do is start this medication to help wean patients off of vasopressors faster. Again, this is not an FDA-approved use as the FDA only approves it for the treatment of symptomatic orthostatic hypotension. This happened in 1996 for those of you who are concerned with historical context. You may be familiar with Metadrin because it has a bunch of off-label uses. For example, patients with uh, underlying cirrhosis, patients on hemodialysis. And I mentioned before that the uses of Midodrin in the ICU are to potentially help avoid inserting central lines, um, as well as a potential benefit to decrease length of stay in ICU patients. Because if you think about it, if a patient's on Midodrin and they don't need norepinephrine or phenylephrine, for example, then, you know, you can get them out of the ICU faster. Up to this point, there really weren't any good efficacy studies. There were some observational and prospective studies, which are not the most robust thing in the world. But now we have the MIDAS trial, which is pretty cool because I've been, I've been, like I mentioned before, awaiting this for quite a while. But I really wasn't expecting the results of the study to be a flop. And here's a spoiler alert. It, it really didn't work for this, for this population. I personally have been using Metadrin in my practice in the ICU for several years. Like everything else in medicine, guys, it works on some patients and in other patients it don't. It doesn't, excuse me. I can't speak today. I've seen patients become normal tensive on midodrin, and then when I try to wean it off, they're hypotensive again. But ultimately, what the authors looked for in this randomized controlled trial was to see if midodrin shortens the direction, excuse me, the duration for which patients need IV vasopressors. So they wanted some concrete data here, and I really got to tip my hat to them for this because everything else has been observational and anecdotal practices. So what did the authors find when they provided midodrin to patients compared to placebo? The primary outcome of this study was the median time to discontinuation of IV vasopressors. In other words, when could they turn off the drip? And honestly, there was no difference here, my friends. The p-value was 0.62. Turns out that it took a median of 23.5 hours in the midodrin arm to turn off the IV vasopressors versus 22.5 hours in the control arm. This is a little bit disappointing because I thought that there was going to be some difference or at least, you know, some, some inclination that the midodrin arm was going to do better. There was also no difference in the time to discharge readiness from ICU. There was no difference in the median length of stay in the ICU. There was no difference in hospital length of stay nor ICU readmission. In other words, in this patient population that they studied, which was mostly surgical patients again, there was no difference by giving patients midodrin at all. Then with regards to adverse effects, they noticed bradycardia in 7.6% of patients. This is a little bit lower than what we saw in the RISD study, which is a study that I've discussed before, where up to 15% of patients in that study had bradycardia. So then the question is, where do we go from here? And this is pretty quite, this is honestly quite frustrating. I'm going to speak a little bit off the cuff here. Some people will look at the data and say, well, we need to throw metadrin in the trash. It simply doesn't work. But to be quite frank, this is, not, this is not how I feel about this. I mean, this is, first of all, a heterogeneous patient population, not, 
The majority of the patients were patients who were surgical patients. They weren't even sepsis patients, which is where, where we use this a lot. At least I do in my practice. And again, this is not medical advice by any means. Please read the study for yourself on all those disclaimers. But midodrine is an extremely ex inexpensive medication compared to an ICU bed. We know that therapeutics don't necessarily work on everybody, but again, and it has to do with the bell curve and the distribution, is it might end up helping some people, just just not everybody. I mean, I could I could say that I've seen it work in my practice. I know that that's the worst quality quality level type of evidence possible. I understand that. That's my opinion. But I'm not gonna stop giving patients metadrin when it's when it's so inexpensive. I could give them a dose. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, I peel it off and I just discontinue it. Continue forward with other things. I mean, this is the this is the beauty, but also the frustration of evidence-based medicine. It's honestly an exact science, and we need to continue doing our best to help out these patients. But I'd like to know what your thoughts are. Will you continue using metadrin in your practice? I know that if you're listening on the podcast, this is not some place where you could go ahead and drop a comment. But if you're listening to this on my YouTube channel, then you could go ahead and drop a comment below. But if you're still hanging out with me at this point in the podcast, I really appreciate your support. If you have a way of uh, giving me a five-star review or a thumbs up on YouTube, or even better yet, share my content, I greatly appreciate it. Help the channel grow, help these messages of evidence-based practice you know, especially when I say <laughs> the evidence says it doesn't work, but I'm going to continue using it. This is part of the art of medicine. And there are a couple other trials that are coming down the down the pipeline. And let me see more or less when they're going to come out. Uh, I know there was a feasibility study and another one that was completed in May of 2020, which is titled Metadrin for Metadrin use for hypotension requiring IV vasopressors therapy and early septic shock. So we'll see what happens with those because I'm impatiently waiting for the results to see if it can help me figure out how to better take care of my patients. Thank you all for your support. Have a great day. Bye.